Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for attending this session on pharma-led research, specifically to pharma-led research to banish pests without pesticides. Um, this has been run by the Innovative Farmers, and I should talk through them at the moment. Just to introduce myself, I'm Jerry Olford. I'm a farming advisor at the Soil Association. Um, and it's great to be part of this project. And it's really, personally, it's really good that I'm actually able to be part of this session because I'm actually isolating with COVID. So um, the fact that I can do this without um, having, um, so I can actually do this because I wouldn't have been allowed to go to Oxford today. So it's brilliant to be part of this project. We got four very good speakers, very good projects here that we're talking about um, as part of the session. And I'm going to allow them each to introduce themselves as they go along so that we can get as much time for discussion as we are going forward. Please use the chat to ask questions. Um, and what I will do is we will sort of triage them as we go along. And so questions relevant to each individual presentation, I will ask after the presentation. Um, questions that are broader ones, we will leave to discussion at a later stage. Okay. So what is innovative farmers? Um, to a certain way, it's almost shouldn't be asking this question. We should, hopefully everybody knows what innovative farmers is. And innovative farmers has actually been going for 10 years as 10 years of farmer led innovation, which is um, very much, that's the point of it. The whole idea started with the idea that there was an awful lot of research being done that wasn't relevant to farmers, that farmers, didn't necessarily want or benefit or it's not what they needed. And so Innovative Farmers was set up to try and break out to let farmers be in control and in charge of what was happening. Where we are now is that we need this massive amount of farmer-led research. Farmers do a lot of research themselves, but what we don't do very well is tell other people about it. So this very, very, very complicated phrase at the top, farmer-centered multi-actor approach to co-innovation. Um, so it's like management speak. But really what it means is that you as the farmer are in control of the direction of travel of the research that we do. The focus is very much on sustainability, very much a way of making sure that we just progress the way that we develop from an agroecological point of view. There's a very strong focus that we have to work with industry and we have to work with the academic partners. And we have examples of those in today's session. We also want to make sure it's practical and it's highly collaborative. That means that farmers who are part of the trials are very much involved and it's very much led by what they do on their farm. So even within the context of the trial, it is still farmer led. The organization as a whole, we offer facilitation and we also offer a small amount of grant funding. This is not a big grant funding project. This is, doesn't pay hundreds of thousand pounds. It just pays for those costs the farmers has to incur. Um, we also remain as independent as we can be, and we do release all the data and all the results as soon as it is practically possible, even if they are not as good as we would like them to be. And we also, as a consequence, use an awful lot of knowledge exchange and we support events. We use information goes out on press online and what we consider is massively important, particularly going forward into the next five or six years when there's a very, very uncertain direction of travel is we think it's really important that peer-to-peer -peer learning, farmers learning from each other, farmers seeing what other people do right and do wrong and adapting the research to fit their farming systems is massively important for the next few years. What we feel is that farmers have the right to demand the appropriate research that they want. And we want the group members that become both knowledgeable producers and also knowledge users, because there's an awful lot of people, when we talk about the trialists later on, people involved, there's an awful lot of what some people call hangers on. There are people who are not part of the trial, but are listening in, watching, keeping a part of it. And what we're also particularly keen on is that we're looking here for problems, looking for solutions. We're not looking for solutions and then looking for a problem to justify the work. But what is important is the development phase of the field lab is crucial. Now, over the last 10 years, we have supported over 120 field labs across all of the UK. We have engaged with more than 15,000 farmers um, since 2012, working together. And for many of the farmers, they've come back to do more work or be more involved or just be members of different groups over a period of time, just listening into what's happening. And we have invested more, nearly a half a million pounds of funding towards small grants to assist these groups. And for those farmers being involved, 
half have said they've made changes to their farming practice because of field labs. Um, for those of you who are on Twitter and whatever, quite a lot of chatter in the last couple of days because we finally had some frosts, which means that people have been able to apply the rolling cover crops to terminate them, which is something a research project we did about three years ago. So people keep on going and listening and learning and maybe even doing practices they didn't even know was a Dungeon Farmers Field Lab two or three years ago. For those people who have been involved in the network, 84% said they'd learned something new as a consequence. And some of that may have been about the conversations that were being had during the meetings, which wasn't directly related to the project. Again, peer-to-peer -peer work and knowledge and explaining. And 99% of the network members said they would re recommend us. Of course they would. So why does this work? An idea comes from a group of farmers. It could be done through an existing discussion group. It could be two or three farmers make, ask for the same sort of work to be done. And if you have an idea for a field lab, please mention it either in the chat here or go on to the FOVA page and more information will be, you can put it into the chat line there. What we then do are identify existing knowledge and suitable topics. So working with a coordinator, and I work as a coordinator on some trials, other people do and others, we establish a group to find a direction of travel the group wants to go and set realistic expectations. You know, we can't turn around and say, we want to reinvent the wheel, there's no point. We can say, how can we make use of this? So we formulate a clear question and co-design the trial. And it's farmer led. So we are asking you to carry on doing what you're doing and introduce a different concept into what you're doing to see if it works in comparison with business as usual. The group will then apply for funding to cover their trial costs and we progress to the field lab where the group will, subject to COVID, meet regularly. And for example, on one of the trials, there's a very, very strong WhatsApp group where there's a lot of conversations going on. As a result of the trial, we get results. This is analysed by the researcher and through the group to find and identify what practices are happening. And again, over the course of the trial, sometimes the trial basis changes slightly. Um, a living mulch field lab, we're changing the varieties of clovers we're using because we found the first mixture is too aggressive. We share the findings. WhatsApp groups, conferences like this, innovative farmers, um, field lab journals, all of these are methods in which we get the information out. Articles in Farmers Weekly, Farmers Guardian, um, any other sorts of organisations. And then from there, we expand and move forward. People adapt the practices and occasionally we then continue with another field lab, which is other funding streams that needed to answer further questions. So that's the way this works. And the whole idea behind this is to demonstrate some of the practices, some of the projects that we've been involved with in the past and going forward. So the four trials we're going to be talking about, no two of them have been completed. So they've got results and, and are benefiting and moving the farming process forward. The other two are just in the process of starting. So we just have an idea of the way in which we set up these projects. Okay, so. The first one of these trials um, is a project that came about for, as will be explained in this, a very, very definite reason and a reason that we need to be doing research in a, ahead of the way that changes happen. So I'm going to hand over to George. George will explain about his own farming system and his involvement in the trial. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to say for, for a start, thank you very much to Innovative Farmers um, for, for, for all the farmers who generated the, the whole idea in the first place. It was a great treat to be involved and I'm looking forward to being part of projects, other projects in the future. Uh, on this occasion, we're discussing the defoliation of uh, oilseed rape. And I took part in a field lab through the winter of 19, uh, 2019 to 2020. Uh, and we were using sheep to graze our rape. And, um, and I'll press on with my presentation and hope all, be all will become clear. I was very fortunate to be able to join one of the uh, field labs two years ago. This one was investigating the value of defoliation of rape to try to beat the cabbage stem flea beetle, um, which anybody who grows rape knows all too much about. In our case, we were using sheep and some of the other farms in the field lab mowers were being used. Uh, first of all, a quick bit of background. Uh, here in Dorset, uh, I'm farming in partnership with my brother. We rent 800 hectares from a private landlord on the Bryanston estate near Blandford. 
The soils are chalk based with flints undulating to steep in places and rising to 700 foot with an annual rainfall of some 41 inches. For many years, our cropping system has evolved. Rotations, cultivations, break crops and manures all play their part. Our soils have definitely improved since we stopped plowing in 2002 and organic manures have made a, a great deal more difference. Uh, the wet autumn of 2019 taught us that we should be less frightened of late sowing of winter crops. And at the same time, we were coming to terms with the fact that insecticides were probably doing more harm than good, killing off potential predators of common crop pests like flea beetle and aphids. Later sown cereal crops are less vulnerable to aphid and hence barley yellow dwarf virus. And we were failing to control flea beetle in rape, so it was a pretty easy, easy decision to give up insecticides altogether. Since then, it's been surprising to find how many other farmers have reached the same conclusion. To bring us right up to date, after extensive research and demos of um, shiny machines, we've moved into direct drilling, not necessarily on every acre, but if there's no reason why not, we will direct drill into the remnants of the previous crop or a cover crop without disturbing the soil by cultivation. Developing issues uh, affecting arable farms. You can see there's a list here. I'm not just gonna read out what's on the slide. You can read that while I'm talking a little more detail. Most of these issues are affecting most arable farmers today. Removal of pesticides from the market, <clears throat> excuse me, and the realization that farming could be heading down a blind alley if we follow the same intensive route that's been dominant for the last 50 years is encouraging us to look in different directions. In this experiment, we were investigating the value of defoliating rape plants to reduce the number of viable cabbage stem flea beetle remaining in the field and damaging the rape crops as they grow. There are two aspects of damage by the flea beetle. Firstly, adults fly into fields of emerging rape shortly after sowing, and high pressure attacks can destroy whole fields of the tiny emerging plants. Before the neonicotinoid seed dressings were banned across Europe in 2013, this grazing was largely held in check and plants emerged safely. However, this family of chemicals was strongly linked to harm in foraging bees in springtime when rape crops are flowering. So the EU outlawed their use, which it should be noted still continues in many other areas of the world, including those we are doing trade deals with. This left only pyrethroid sprays in the armory to which beetle populations are being increasingly found to be resistant. If the adults survive, they start to lay eggs on surviving rape plants. The eggs hatch and the larvae will try to burrow into the petioles and down into the stems. Since organophosphates disappeared from Europe decades ago, there have been no chemicals which can control the larvae once inside the plant. I had read about the uh, defoliation trial in the farming press in the winter of 1920 and eventually made contact with Fiona Geary at AHDB, the coordinator for this project, who then put me in touch with Fran Pickering and Dr. Sasha White at ADAS, who led the project and provided the scientific heft. We chose a field with a relatively good and even establishment where our sheep had already started grazing. It was divided up with electric fencing and grazed by a bunch of mature ewes from late December through to late January. Subsequently, we have usually set ourselves the target of finishing any grazing of rape by or shortly after Christmas. Here are the details of how we grew the crop. Home saved variety Barbados sown on 20th of August 2019 with a seed rate of three and a half kilos. This followed an application of biosolids which was worked into the soil with our Sumo Trio cultivator. Sowing date was determined more by moisture status than anything else. There had been rain in the previous day or two, causing a break in harvesting and giving us time to sow the rape into near optimum soil conditions. The crop survived the early adult attacks and grew away quickly. Some people say that the aroma of biosolids can act as a deterrent, though I'm not convinced myself. We had decided that at prevailing rate prices, a three tonne a hectare yield would be acceptable. In the previous regime with neonicotinoid seed treatments, we'd become used to yields of four tonnes plus. <clears throat> In 2021, we've managed to shave a further 80 pounds a hectare off the growing cost at the bottom of that slide. Uh, although the way rapeseed prices have since uh, arisen since, we would still have made a very respectable margin even at the higher cost per hectare. 
This is the part where rape growers watching, uh, who are uh, consider themselves a nervous disposition, may wish to hide behind the sofa. Uh, I'll say from the outset that there was no expectation of yield increase from grazing. Flea beetle damage would have to be very serious to see grazed plots yield more than ungrazed plots. However, the outturn is more complicated. In our case, we've been looking for a way to manage rape which remains profitable. And while rape prices were in the 300s, mid 300s, uh, which they were when we started this trial, I was focused on growing the crop as cheaply as possible and would set, settle for a mediocre yield if it could produce an acceptable gross margin. As a break crop, much of the value of the crop is achieved by the enhanced yield of the following wheat crop. Uncontrollable flea beetle has put a ceiling on yield, so I felt it was foolish to risk high upfront expenditure. Here you can see the effect on the plants of the grazing. We were definitely flying by the seat of our pants when gauging how hard to graze the plots, but we felt that to make it worthwhile, we should allow the sheep to take off as much leaf as possible, but try to preserve the growing points. In a mild winter, this is tricky if the plant starts to stem extend early, like some has this year. Here is an ungrazed plant in early March. Plants like this are what we were used to and were very happy with pre the neonic ban. Now I see it as a reservoir for flea beetle larvae, which will not only hollow out the plant from inside, but will provide a new population of adults to threaten next year's crop. Uh, this is a grazed plot in the same, uh, sorry, ungrazed plot in the same part of the field. Although uh, the ungrazed plots developed faster and flowered well before the grazed, it suffered more obvious damage. Some plants had clearly lost the fight against the beetle onslaught, as you can see. Jeff Bailey from ADAS visited in early March to collect plants from each plot to take back to the lab and count the larvae. A laborious task, I'm sure, but it showed up interesting differences between plots. Six and nine larvae per plot in grazed plots and 26 per plant in the ungrazed. Quite a significant difference, I'm sure you'll agree. Non-penetrating larval damage was easily found. Much scarring on stems and petioles showed where larvae were trying to get into plants. Many do not succeed. Rape has always been remarkably good at compensating and branches profusely. And here you can see new branch, a new branch emerging from a damaged leaf axle. Unfortunately, many larvae do make it into the plants and can be easily found in both the grazed and ungrazed plots. The grazed plots were clearly later to flower than the ungrazed. Sorry, I've got too many pages here. I'll just flip through these ones. Taking us through the season. The un, you, we can see there's the, the, it got quite even at the beginning of June, um, uh, but then the differences showed up again. By harvest, it all looked much the same. Um, hang on, sorry, I got in a muddle with my pages. All right. A pod sticking agent was applied a few weeks before harvest to help the earlier ripening ungrazed plot to hold on till the rest was ready. We also applied glyphosate to the whole field to ensure we could cut the whole field in one session. We're not entirely happy about the use of glyphosate on ripening crops in general and how the idea might sell with consumers, but whilst we're still allowed to do it, there are odd occasions where it can get us out of a hole. So here we are harvesting. Um, we have discovered that yield maps produced by the combine are all very well in theory. And we were relying on them to give us a full picture of the differences in yield between the different plots. And luckily, Sasha White's analysis of the raw data was able to tease out meaningful results. But the pretty pictures generated by the combine are not as useful as they could be. The tram lines are 36 meters apart and the combine header is 10.5 meters wide. So every three lengths of the field finds the combine cutting a tramline wheel mark, which gives a falsely low yield reading. This video shows this all too clearly. Let's get rid of all those pages. 
In spite of that, we can clearly see trends. Uh, and it looks like the ungrazed plot is the best part of the field, green being good and red being poor. Sasha White's summary of the trial follows and explains that although this year was a low yielding season, our own rape crop only managed 2.7 tonnes across the farm, most participants in the trial would utilise this technique again. A wet winter makes it more difficult, but as a management tool, it offers the opportunity to reduce spend on weed killers, in, uh, on weed killers, insecticides, growth regulators and fungicides. <clears throat> the sheep eat out most of the weeds, they reduce the leaf area susceptible to diseases, they reduce the pressure from the flea beetle and they reduce the size of the final crop canopy, which of course is where the yield reduction probably arises. Uh, so here we have um, Sasha White's summary of the trial. Uh, the control of cabbage stem flea beetle larvae by defoliating white winter oilseed rape in the winter was investigated at five sites in England. Host farmers defoliated using a topper or grazing with sheep. The timing, duration and severity of defoliation differed between sites. Assessments of larval numbers in March showed that defoliation significantly reduced larval populations at four sites, with larval, larvae per plant reduced by an average of 68%. Larval reductions were higher in grazed crops than topped crops. In general, defoliation resulted in yield losses, with an average 12% yield reduction at sites where robust yield comparisons were possible. Yield results were similar to the previous field lab of 2018-19, but differed from other previous work and may have been due to poor weather conditions preventing crop recovery and high levels of late larval invasion. Despite yield losses, most host farmers would consider using the approach again under the right conditions, e.g. a drier winter, we don't get many of them, for management of a forward crop or for weed control. Jerry, how am I doing for time? Because I've got a few more, but that could be a useful stopping point. Yeah, we are getting, I think, yeah, we've had 10 minutes. So if, if you could stop there, that would be perfect. Okay, I will just go to the very last slide uh, where I have a summary um, then, in which case so I've got a little a homemade recipe for oilseed rape growing, where we've got to with oilseed rape growing. No insecticides, manure in the seed bed, timing of sowing, moisture in the seed bed, companion cropping to disguise the emerging rape seedlings, which we've tried this year, uh, provide plenty of habitat for potential predators, uh, grazing of the most forward crops, and be prepared to accept a lower yield and keep costs down to preserve a margin. And there we are. Great, thank you. If you'd like to unshare. Yep. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, George. That's superb. <clears throat> um, for those of you who've noticed as you were flicking through, George has actually now got wildflower strips down through the middle of the field, which actually opens up a totally different conversation as well, which is great. <laughs> um, there's been a question from Sue. Just say your grazed and unplots were adjacent. If you had only grazed plots, so if you grazed the whole field, as in a trial situation, do you think you would actually um, have even further lowered larval and pest counts as a consequence? Um, I'm sure, yes, if I'd grazed the whole field, uh, I would have done, but we, we had to have a comparison and it was, yeah. it was either a part of the same field, um, which is where the crop is most even, or it could have been a field next door. But as soon as you get into a different field, you've got different variables, different soil and possibly different time of sowing, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, obviously we know this is the, the the one negative of a trial. You've got to have a control, and in fact, with alternative farmers' trials, we always have a, a control or a business as usual section, yeah. so that we know we're getting a result. Otherwise, it's just a field. You're trying something different. That's right. I mean, and, and, and to make it scientific, it's it's quite tricky on a field scale when you've got electric fences to move and set up, and yeah. timing of applications of any pesticides and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, there's also a quick question from Celine said any extra positive impact of sheep grazing, for example, fertilization or the stronger or tolerant plants. And also just an economic question. You mentioned that you've got a lower yield, but you've also mentioned that you increased the, the you managed to fatten lambs quicker by using this. So do you think that's as a positive economic effect in the longer term? Um, overall, my gut fit, I haven't tried to cost all that adding the value of the lamb fattening. Um, because usually sheep aren't valuable enough to, for it to make too much difference. <laughs> I'm not the most enthusiastic sheep farmer, but my brother is responsible for that. And 
sheep are on a knife edge on the farm at the moment anyway for other reasons um uh, i'm most interested in growing as crops as largely with as good a margin as possible but i think we've grazed much of our rate this autumn um because i think it makes the rate more manageable uh, for the reasons i alluded to in the presentation um we're not using an autumn fungicide which used to be a regular thing because we've de done the defoliation um there's no danger of needing growth regulator and it's definitely reducing our weed killer input so actually it's it's become quite helpful and where we've got a, a good vigorous companion crop with it they're eating out most of the companion crop as well yep um the vetches and clovers and what have you which you know i'm going to have to take out at some point yep okay and then just one final question from gary is um really about the grazing regime was i like to grade grazing regime a shorter period give you less wheat yield reduction and i suppose you did allude to it and i know the problem we had with the trial in the first year was what time of year you actually did the grazing and how yes. that worked and you know, um, there's, well, there's management got, to learn i'm guessing is what the question is matters. we're learning all the time we're actually into our third year of of um sheep grazing of rape now the, the the trial happened in our first was our first year of it and we've tried to refine it we graze it the, the final slides that i wasn't able to show show a field from last year, which I just happened to have a good set of pictures from. Um, and although the grazing made it look very uneven, by the time we got to harvest, it did look quite even. We were going, we were making much more effort not to overgraze. Um, and that shows in the yield map quite nicely that it was much more even over most of the field. And it was definitely less intensive grazing, but then you're probably taking off less, fewer larvae as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You graze it harder you'll get rid of more larvae but i think the larvae isn't the whole picture with us we got charlock problems in some of our rape which is very difficult and expensive to to control and miraculously we found that the sheep seem to graze the charlock preferentially to the to the rape which staggered me brilliant so <laughs> so let's use wildlife we talk about wildlife we talk about nature friendly ipm let's actually remember that the livestock on the farm can can be part of our management practices Without question, the big ones and the small ones. Yeah, we're very we're very keen on the the um, wildflower strips in the fields. Yeah, and um, we've just applied. We're in the process of waiting for a stewardship new stewardship scheme, and we've we've um, put plenty of those into our application. And we've got six meter margins around all of our pretty much all of our arable land have done for the last twelve years under HLS. So, absolutely brilliant. Okay, thank you, George. Um, Moving on to the next one, Gary. a different sort of pest, a different sort of livestock um, and a different farming system. So I'm um, going to hand over to Anne from. Um, hopefully. And irritatingly, we have um, an IT problem. So hopefully I can get it showing. Yeah. So. Oops. Okay. Um, I'd hand over to Anne. Um, Anne from HDB, who's going to talk through another completed trial, the trap crops for, for um, PCM control. Anne. Good morning. I'm Dr. Anne Stone from AHDB Potatoes, and was the coordinator for this um, field lab, which has taken place over two years. Next, please. Sorry, I'm just trying to find that. The people yep. are the foundation of each field lab and the group of farmers involved here had worked together their shared experiences with cover crops and biofumigants and discussed with staff from Harper Adams. And although it's not essential, in this case, all those involved in the field lab had previous work together, knew each other. Next, please. Now, technically we had a huge challenge because potato cyst nematodes are the most serious pests of potatoes in Britain. 
the cysts remain in the soil for many years, are very hard to kill, and it's an enormously expensive problem, causing people to have much longer rotations with less potatoes than they would like, or to use very costly nematicides. However, other solanaceous crops or plants produce the same root exudate as does potatoes. They cause the cysts to hatch, but the larvae can't complete their life cycle and so die. And there are two such trap crops available commercially, Solanum sisimbrifolium, often called sisim, and Solanum scabrum. And over two years, this field lab in the first year looked at time of drilling and depth, this year at nitrogen nutrition, and over both years has been comparing the two species with each other. There's very detailed information on this field lab available on the um, Innovative Farmers website. Next, please, Jerry. On the left, you can see the Lemkin drill that was used on three sites this year with all the crops sown on the same day. On the right, there's the simple layout used on two of the farms, and then there was more replication on the third because of the difficulty of sampling for PCN and its erratic distribution, more replicates are ideally needed for this work than other types of research. Next, please. This graph shows some of the results. On the y-axis is the percentage ground cover and on the x-axis, the days from drilling. And the outstanding product, the blue line at the top, was from scabrum at the higher nitrogen rate. The ground cover matters because it's... That's all right, Jerry, move on. <laughs> Our ground cover is closely correlated with what happens below ground, as we know from previous research. The uh, roots are also beneficial with scabrum. They're more finely divided. There's more weight of fine roots than in the more widely used sisimbrifolium. It's a relatively new entrant. And next, please. We had a fantastic um, field day on the 6th of October. Uh, you can see Matt back on the right displaying a scabrum plant, showing its fine roots. And on the left, there's sisim in the foreground and scabrum behind. Now, the folk in the picture all look quite ordinary, but in fact, their names are a who's who of PCN knowledge in Britain, both farmers and agronomists. They came from far distances because there's real fear in the industry that um, after 2024, when the main nematicide is up for reapproval, it may go and everybody needs to be prepared for what happens next. Next, please. The crucial factor is below ground, whether the PCN are being killed. You can see on the left that there is a natural decline each year of about 20%. The trap crops increased that decline, the best being scabrum at 100 kilo of nitrogen per hectare. That's the comparison on the far right. However, we weren't satisfied with that result. We knew it should have been better. And the reason was the poor establishment in that field. The soil had been quite fluffy and we really ought to have rolled it both before and after drilling. 
which point links with the next slide, Jerry. The uh, growers concerned made the emphasize the importance of rolling and of attention to detail when growing these crops. I could talk for an hour on this list of what the farmers feel needs to be done next to develop crop, trap crops further. But an important point is that they are a new technology and Britain is ahead of most of the world in this. So they would very much value inclusion in ELMS to get some financial support because we are still at an early stage. Okay, Jerry. My own view is that the word trap crop is a misnomer. They are actually wild plants from abroad and they haven't been properly turned into crops. So although more farm-based work is needed, we also need a lot of effort by the seed company to do selection under our conditions and turn them into true crops. Next, please. Now, I've been the coordinator for two field labs, one on use of brackish water for irrigation, and then this one on trap crops. And I find that it is a, a brilliant brand. People understand the rules of the scheme. It helps that there are standardized ways of approaching trials and a limit to funding. And because of that, the groups have worked really well together with everybody doing their bit. Morale has been great, and I've really enjoyed the coordination work. But not everything is perfect. There is inflation, particularly in technology and diagnostic tests, and we weren't able to do as much as we would have liked. And I can see this becoming a problem going forwards. Nevertheless, the, both the trials have been successes. They've already made considerable impact um, out in the real world. And now, do you have any questions? Yes, <laughs> I've got questions. Yes, we have had one from Georgina actually said, are there, and you, you highlighted it in your comments a, a little bit, but are there potential weed issues with introducing a different Solanum um, species in following potato crops. Is this something we're going to be careful of for just bringing a different problem? Yes, it is a potential problem. With the better established um, Cicimbrifolium, it isn't. We're not so sure about um, Solanum scabrum, which is much newer, and it does produce a lot of fruit. But being a tropical crop from the highlands of Africa, we think that it will probably be safe. But with any new introduction, that can't be taken for granted. No, no exactly. Um, and actually, a little bit related to that as well, a question from Gary, is do these trap crop plants really need to be taken as far as flowering to get the good effect? Or is it possible to keep them, leave them in the ground less time, which means they're not to seed? Um, um, do you think the majority of egg hatch happens in the first five weeks after the seedlings emerge? Is that the case? Or, yeah, so yes, we... that's another good question. The one problem with these being wild plants is that they don't all germinate together. And so after five weeks, some will still be germinating. And that's one reason for more selection being needed to get faster germination and emergence. However, flowering starts fairly soon before we've got complete ground cover. And so it wouldn't be possible to stop that early and probably not before there were mature fruits. Um, however, that is a, another area that could be um, researched further. 
Okay, so the question then becomes, is because of this possible random germination, the, the sort of slightly nature, the effect of nature on this, do you still feel these is a better direction of travel than using biofumigation techniques and the like? There can be much greater kill, um, up to 85% or even more with um, trap crops. And you never achieve that level of kill with biofumigation. So that's why both techniques have got a place. That's good. And another question, I don't know whether this was something you looked at, or whether we need to extend it further, or did you find any difference in emergence at different planting nets? So again, it comes yes. down to the establishment. Shallower is better. These are small seeds and less than one centimeter is probably about right. That can be a problem if the ground is very dry. So depth of drilling uh, should be adjusted according to the moisture in the soil. Fine, that's great, that's brilliant. And this is part of the evolution of these projects. We, you know, a trial never actually solves the question, does it? The trial just <laughs> opens up other questions that we need to take it further on. And that's one of the brilliant things about these sort of projects. It just develops moving on, doesn't it? Get farms involved. Yes. Well, farmers who are growing trap crops are pretty good about sharing their results. They know that it actually benefits them because the bigger the market can become, the more money that the seed producer can put into further research. That's so it, it's um, collaboration rather than competition. Brilliant. Absolutely superb. Defining innovation, innovative farmers in itself. That's great. That, thanks, Joanne. Thanks for that. We need to move on now, um, moving on to Ali Kappa. Um, yet another range of crops that we're working with and um, yet another way of looking at avoiding pesticides. So, Ali, please, over to you. Thanks very much, Terry. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, let's get these slides working then. Um, it's delightful to be here actually and um, I feel really lucky and very humble because I'm about to take you through what is for our farm our second field lab with innovative farmers. Um, uh, I'm not invested at all in innovative farmers but I, we do love it um, both as an industry, hop industry but also here on this farm. Um, what I think what we love about innovative farmers is uh, the agility um, it's really quick and easy to get a decision and um, very easy to make things happen. Um, and I'll just point everybody to the Innovative Farmers website with case studies. If they want to have a look at our other um, uh, uh, a field lab, which has been going for about four years now, which is the um, cover crops in hops. And actually that has inspired, I don't know whether we'll succeed, but it's inspired and Innovate UK application to see whether we can actually make those cover crops wildflowers to increase the biodiversity in hops. Um, and so that piece of work is, as you've just been discussing, leading to more work now. So let's see how that goes. Um, but anyway, just a bit of a plug for innovative farmers. So I'm here to talk about the control of the two spotted spider mite um, on hops um, with a predator um, and there are a number of different options but we've selected Ambacillus and Sony um, for, for this um, field lab and it's quite a quick one we're hoping for results um, now in 2022. So first of all who's been involved um, obviously innovative farmers, NIAB and EMR and it's Michelle Fountain at East Morning Research which is part of NIAB, um, Bioline who provide the predators and I'm um, just going back to what was just being said about the collaboration. Um, people tend to just, um, because this is quick and easy um, to do these um, field labs, um, uh, Byline have been very um, helpful in providing the predators um, for no charge for this trial. Um, Hutchinson's agronomy team are helping us. Um, and um, in terms of the growers, um, the British Hop Association is our crop association and there are um, only 59 hop growers in the UK, um, so to have five participating is brilliant, it's 10% of the industry. Um, the reason for it being a British Hop Association led piece is that is our way of getting it out to all growers really fast so that we can share the results. 
Um, so that's the who. Um, just in case anybody hasn't seen a hop yard, and because we're such a, a, a novel crop, um, this shot on the left is Golding's hops, and this is taken from a ladder. I'm very safely, um, I must say, from a health and safety point of view, up a ladder, um, looking across the top of the crop here. Um, the crop grows to about 16 to 18 foot high. Um, and that's just a plug for the cover crops on the right hand side. Um, that's a lovely shot of cover crops in the hops in the spring of last year. Um, so that's what hops look like. And we've got this problem with um, spider mite control. So why is it needed? Well, all that lovely foliage on the left hand side there, um, it's the comb, the flower that we are harvesting for um, the brewer. But we've obviously got all this foliage and all this plant matter. Um, and it's that that the spider loves to suck. They suck the sap, decimate the foliage that just completely destroys yield. And if they're allowed to um, really get control of the plant, then the hop cones actually become unsaleable. Those lovely, um, sorry, on the previous, oh, I've got a bit mad now, sorry. Just go back. No, I don't know what I've done here, Jerry, but bear with me. Okay, let me just go again here. Just wanted to explain that um, if the spider's allowed to get into the hop cone, then the hop cone actually becomes rusty red and unsaleable. It loses its green colour. So that's obviously a bit of a crisis for us if that happens. Um, so that's something we can't allow to happen. Um, and in warm conditions in the summer, they can multiply really fast. And if you allow them to take control of a hop yard, they can destroy it, it depends on the temperature and the conditions but in a matter of days, if not just a couple of weeks. Um, so it is a pest that we have to control because um, it is a pest that has been known to destroy whole hop yards. So, so why have we chosen this particular um, predator? Well, it's a predator of the two spotted spider mite and other mites. It also doesn't just it feeds on pollen and larvae as well as the pest itself um, when it's mature. Um, so what that means is we've got a, a broader amount of things we can do with it. It's also active at a broader temperature. So we have tried Phytocelius in the past, um, but this Ambicelius andersoni is really good in a broader temperature range, particularly lower temperatures. We can use it down to six degrees centigrade. And because it's effective at lower temperatures, it means we can use it earlier and later in the season. Um, we're harvesting hops in September, they're emerging in April, May. So it gives us the opportunity to think about using um, the, this predator in the autumn or in the spring, which is precisely what we're doing with this trial. I'm just pausing because my slides are not moving on. I don't know what, what's causing the lag here. I'm really sorry, everybody. Okay, so the how. Um, we are um, doing a replicated trial with two treatments and eight replications. Um, we did applications post-harvest in September and October. And depending on the assessment of those, we may well do another one once more in the spring. Um, and this isn't for the faint hearted. You saw the scale of our hop yards. Um, we are applying a teaspoon of mites, that's about 20 mites, to each plant by hand. Um, obviously, that's quite an expensive operation. But if it works, the idea is that they will consume the hibernating spider females in the autumn on the root of the plant. And that will then reduce the population for the following year. And if it works, it means we won't have to spray. Um, so lots of really exciting stuff for us to learn um, and we're hoping that we will be able to report to the industry in July. So that is my explanation of what we're doing with um, Spider. I don't know whether that's raised any questions. Um, I'll just stop unsharing Jerry so that we can see each other a bit more clearly. Oh, I can see there are a couple of questions that come in. Okay that's brilliant Ali. Um, for those of us who aren't well, actually, I really appreciate hops, but actually in my beer, not 
actually too much awareness of them in the real life. The other thing that's interesting here is that we, we had a question as a result of a session yesterday that's come through to our producer support team about using cover crops in vineyards. So the fact is that although this is a specific trial related to hops, it opens up the whole world of all row crops of that nature and the use, the way we can try and make use of these biological treatments. I can see there is a question, Jerry, in the um, actually in the chat about the cover crops. Um, yeah, there are questions about the cover crop. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, the question there is how long have we been using the cover crop to improve soil and crop health? Um, and uh, you know, it can take years. Have we noticed any reduction in pest attack year on year? It's a really hard one because you're dead right. It does take a long time. Um, but my um, sceptical husband. Um, <laughs> when we first started talking about this, agreed to do a few rows in one yard. Um, we farm just shy of 100 acres of hops. We're now putting cover crops into every hop yard. Um, do we have, you know, evidenced scientific factual data to base that decision on and all that cost because nobody's paying us to do this? And the answer is no, we don't. But it feels like it's improving the soil. It feels like it's reducing our pest thresholds. Um, there is some, obviously some scientific analysis going on of worm counts and the like, um, and that is being published as it's being made available. I think the plan is to do more of that in the spring. Um, so there is, um, there's no evidence. The other thing I would say is um, when we started the cover crop field lab, I think there were four farms involved, more than half the industry, so over 25 growers are now doing cover crops. So it, it's got something's working. Um, uh, so it's really hard. And I think this is what I like about innovative farmers is I don't have to deliver hard results every year for something to continue. Um, innovative farmers is, doesn't create the bureaucracy that um, some other funding streams do. So I would say thank you for that. Um, um, yeah, I think this is certainly one of the points that we've we found we're talking with researchers as well that researchers like innovative farmers for the very reason that they get to work their theories and practices and get some research on farms and they find out how what they're proposing doesn't work or and farmers i've been one you can choose a wheat variety based on what it looks like in a small plot we, we don't use hard science to drive our decisions we feel we use gut feelings and we try something for a year or so if it doesn't work we drop it the fact that people are picking up and using it means that farmers are comfortable using stuff. So um, we have a question here about how much hop foliage was left at the base after harvest to which you apply the predators to. So the answer is we try and actually the, the, the appropriate um, agronomy, if you like, is to leave the minimum foliage. We actually we have a, a process called bind cutting. So when we harvest the hops, we actually take all of the hop out of the yard, but we leave a length of um, stem in the yard. Um, I guess it's about two to three foot tall, what's left in the yard. And we go through and we cut that right down to the base, again, by hand, that's standard. So we were applying the predator to the crown of the hop, to what was left. So there wasn't really any foliage left, there was just the top of the plant, if that makes sense. I hope that answers the question. Um, uh I'm going to preempt the next one a little bit, the next session, by asking you a question. Is actually there are specific plant varieties which are best suited to your predator as well as to the pest? And so, therefore, historically, we'd have said let's avoid the pest host. Now, perhaps we're saying let's make sure we maximize the, the predator host. Um, yes, and I can't, I'm not scientific enough to answer the question precisely, but one of the one of the difficulties we've got in hops, and this is why the cover crop project has been so important, is that our biggest disease threat is verticillium wilt. Verticillium wilt is soil borne. Um, it came into hop yards when we took out hops to feed the nation in the war, and it was introduced when we planted potatoes in hop yards. And we have spent the, all of last century basically trying to breed our way out of that problem. So most of us are now growing wilt resistant or wilt tolerant varieties, but any broadleaf plant can be a host for verticillium wilt. So when we're looking for um, what plants could be a great host for predators, we've always got that problem in the back of our mind that we don't want to give ourselves another problem. And that's why 
Um, some people will think that what we've been doing on the cover crops is a bit limited because we've only been using um, black oat and rye. Um, actually, on farms like ours, where we are growing mostly wilt resistant and wilt tolerant varieties, we've also started to introduce a flowering broad, broad leaf. Um, but we're quite nervous about that. And that's why this next project, um, we've applied for some Innovate UK money to see if we can um, really understand wild flowers and broad leaf wild flowers and what they will do for both pests and predators is really important. Um, if I don't succeed, then I expect I'll be back to maybe do our third field lab with innovative farmers, but we'll see. It's, that's going to cost quite a lot more money. So that's why I went down an Innovate, Innovate UK route. Um, I can see that there is a question in there about wildflower strips and also other habitats like hedges and field margins and boundaries. Actually, all hop yards and orchards, we're in orchard, we grow um, apples as well. Um, every field, every hop yard, every orchard, we tend to surround with hedges and um, uh, 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 windbreaks because it's really important that we create that microclimate. So there, there, are, there is lots of other opportunity for habitat for predators um, and pests on the farm. Um, do you want me to have a go at answering that GMGE crop question? Which was <laughs> I've been trying to hold off that. And I was going to leave that one to the end, actually. I think just, uh, but um, yes, you could do if you wish to. Yeah. Um, so for me, and I'm speaking personally now, but genetic modification has no place on our farm. Um, gene editing is different. Gene editing is about taking. So when you're when you're doing traditional plant breeding, traditional plant breeding methods. Um, do selections year after year um, using assessments to take out problems. So let's let's talk about versicillium wilt, our biggest problem. If I could breed using traditional plant breeding methods, plants which were resistant or tolerant to versicillium wilt, that's exactly what we've done. And I say it's taken us a century. The work started in the 1940s, 50s, and it took until the late 90s for us to really have a population of hot plants which were wilt resistant or wilt tolerant. So would I like to use gene editing to achieve that much faster? Yes, I would. Um, and I think that's where we mustn't get mixed up between genetic modification and gene editing. Gene editing is taking out the bad, bad stuff. It speeds up what traditional plant breeding has been doing for centuries. Genetic modification is very different. You're introducing new genes with genetic modification. So that's my simple layman's answer to that question. I'm not a scientist. And I would just point out the Soil Association's position on GE, GN, GE is that it's not approved under organic rules. It's actually written into our standards and the standards are a legal position. So it's not approved it's organic, a, but I understand the arguments on both sides. Yeah. So we're not going to argue on this. There's a difference. Yeah. Um, OK. Um, one other question. How, no, there was another question I saw in the chat that just quickly I'll pick up on. Is there some evidence that pests can be controlled by deterred or deterred by targeted foliar nutrition um, and is this something that's been done with hops it's like a whole separate subject this um, it is yeah <laughs> foliar um, nutrition is something we do as a matter of course in the orchards um, and uh, to some extent I'm looking my husband is sitting here beside me we don't do it in the hops at the moment he's yeah, not do a little bit I knew we were talking about it um so yes we do it primarily though for the nutritional value if there was um as a byproduct of that if there was a benefit um, on pest control we'd be all over it I can assure you so if that evidence starts to emerge and um, we will definitely be looking at that yeah I suppose the irony is that there's enough evidence from the conventional agriculture to say that um high levels of, of nutrients actually create the, the environment which pests prefer anyway so it's a, it's a circular argument on that one as well isn't it? So. okay i'm going to move on now thank you ali that was actually superb um on to david who's been sat here very very calmly waiting for us to finish um i'll leave you to explain yourself um and what you're doing and how your involvement is within the farmers thank you david Thanks very much, Jerry. And I'm pleased I'm not the only one that's self-isolating as well. I'm on the, the back end of my 10 days, so I'll try and remember to mute if I start any kind of you know, sort of coughing fit. As I... I'll try that again. I'll introduce myself as I do. My name's Dave. I'm from Newcastle University. I guess I'm slightly 
um, different in terms that I'm coming from Innovative Farmers from a research perspective. Um, I'm not actually coordinating the field lab that I'll mention. It's only really just started, um, so I won't be able to say too much about it. Hopefully the slides will come up shortly. Um, I, I, I would like to say that certainly from a, a researcher's perspective, I've been involved now in Innovative Farmers probably since the, the start of 2021, a couple of, of field labs that I've become involved in, mainly to provide some input in terms of how we monitor biodiversity and particularly beneficial insects, um, and, and especially things related to, to use of flowering field margins in different systems. And from a researcher's perspective, it's a fantastic um, thing to be involved in and it really allows me to learn as much from the the farmers that are involved in these groups as I'm sure they they learn from me hopefully they'll learn um, something from me but certainly it's great for me to be able to take a topic that I've worked on for for many many years um, and to be able to share my knowledge with farmers but at the same time to get that broader farm view that I don't necessarily have um, as a scientist to look at how some of what I'm working on can um, be applied in out in the field, but also to get a better idea of how some of the topics that I'm working on and I've, I've always worked on on things like trap cropping, companion planting, flowering field margins, um, how some of those things might fit, but also what some of the challenges are to applying some of those um, things that I'm working on um, in research projects to um, to the farmer's field. I don't think my screen is going to share. It looks like people are saying you're at the end of your slideshow. Ah. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> As I was saying, it's really time. beneficial to work with, the, <laughs> work with people who know how to operate slideshows, for example. Uh, yeah, it would help yeah. me as well, I think. So carry on. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. You ever pointed that one out. Um, so just to, I won't be able to give you too much detail on the particular on this innovative farmers group that I'll be talking about, but I'll introduce the general concept of what we're doing, and we've mentioned some of that actually already. Uh, and then on my final slide, I'll just introduce the field lab that we'll be working on. Um, if we didn't have any constraints on pest populations, this is what would happen in 12 months time. We would have 200,000 million descendants of one pair of houseflies covering the earth to a depth of 15 kilometres. The descendants of one aphid mother at 250 million tonnes would circle the equator a million times. And my personal favourite, the descendants of that pair of cabbage whites would be shooting off into the stratosphere faster than the speed of light. Um, pests are very good at reproducing. That's, that's one of the reasons that they're pests. Fortunately, they don't do this. And that's because we have these natural checks um, on pest populations. Now, some of those natural checks will be due to things like weather, for example, um, but of course we also have all of these beneficial insects, some of which we've been talking about here already today, and I heard quite a lot um, on this topic also yesterday, particularly in some of the pesticide um, sessions. And these, this natural level of good um, biodiversity that's out there, these beneficial predatory and, and parasitic um, insects provide us with various what we call ecosystem services. And one of those services is pest control. We've got things up there that you'll very easily recognise, like ladybirds, for example, that are highly predatory and can consume a large number of aphids um, throughout both their larval and adult stages. Of course, we also get services like pollination um, for those crops that need them. But we know that our, our insects in general, including our beneficial insects, are in decline. Um, and we know that particularly in, in farmland systems, there might be more that we can do um, to promote their, their function and for, to enable us to benefit from them. And we've actually started to pop um, a few values um, on some of these services that I've, that I've stuck onto this slide here. And you can see that's actually quite an old figure for the value of pollination um, to the UK from the, the National Ecosystems Assessment around a, a decade or so ago, because that's actually an old five pound note there in the background. But we've started to assign um, some values to these things, which helps when we're, when we're actually talking about them. And certainly now, I would say over, over the course of my career, I'm probably more popular um, in the last couple of years to give talks on, on this sort of topic than I've been at any time um, in the last 20 or so years. And that's really um, testament to the fact that we are evolving, transitioning our food production systems to really try to deliver as much um, for natural capital going forward um, as they do for nutrition. One of the challenges that we face when we're looking at, at, at trying to leverage these services from beneficial insects is that we have a um, production systems that predominantly exist as monocultures. 
And within that monocultural field, there's not really enough there to satisfy the entire life history needs of these beneficial insects that we have at the top, be they predatory flies, ladybirds um, or hoverflies. So we tend to have, we tend to be reasonably good at weed control. So we have large fields with only one plant in them. And quite often that's not necessarily going to be a flowering plant. And even the most predatory of insects that you'll see at the top of that screen. So even something like a ladybird, for example, that we associate perhaps as only really eating aphids will benefit from floral resource provision. They will benefit from being able to access the right kind um, of pollen, for example. It will, it will either have a benefit to their longevity or the amount that they can, they can reproduce, for example. So we tend to have these monocultural systems that really aren't very friendly um, to beneficial insects. Unfortunately, at the same time, they are very friendly to pest insects. Pest insects tend to be able to get through their entire life cycle. Um, with on a single host plant we've given them these large areas um, of fields that have nothing but that suitable um, host plant in them um, and it that gives them a, it makes it very easy for a pest insect to to find a crop field this very large chemical and visual signature that's coming out from that large stand of appropriate food plants for them and once they're actually on those crop plants it's very hard for them to lose those plants afterwards if they get blown off they get blown off onto a, a, a suitable um, host plant next door historically what we've looked to do is manage those pest insects using pesticides i'm not going to um, dwell on on the on, on that we've had lots already um, throughout the conference and, and today and yesterday around the the challenges that we're facing around continued synthetic um, chemical use and cropping systems but we could look um as we transition away from um, high input use of, of those sorts of, of chemistries, we could look to try and leverage natural biological control more um, by promoting some of these beneficial insects. And one way we can do that is to try and put back some of the resources that they need to um, thrive into our farming system. So one way we can do that is with flowering field margins. And that will hopefully bring back um, some of those beneficial insects and it will give us um, that level of pest control that we're looking for. It's also probably I should point out here, and again, it's something we've touched upon that providing that floral um, resource, so a little bit of shelter, some pollen and some nectar, um, will satisfy quite a lot of the needs of some of those insects, but it also things like hedgerows, wooded areas can be very important for certain species, particularly when you're looking at their full life cycle, so overwintering sites, um, um, perhaps. Just a, and again, it's something we've touched upon in the questions that um, uh, that we just had in the previous talk, that you do need to take care to select the right seed mix. And what you want to try to do is to stack benefits from any individual seed mix. So where historically we may have developed um, seed mixes that were very targeted to certain groups, farm and birds being a very good example um, with seed provision, um, pollinator mixes being a very good example that were targeted to promote bees. Different groups of beneficial insects will rely on different types of flowers. And you can probably imagine that's quite easily that something like a butterfly with a very long tongue feeds on a very different type of flower um, to something like a hoverfly, which has more of a sponge that it uses to, um, to suck up um, nectar. And a little bit of work here that just shows the, the differences in attraction between bumblebees, so providing a pollination service and parasitoid wasps, um, when some work looked at a mix that had been designed for pollinators, a mix that had been designed for biological control providers, so like your, your parasitoid wasps, for example, that will attack aphids, and a combination of those two seed mixes. And when we use very specific mixes, we, we may benefit one group, but it might be at the expense of another. And really what, in my opinion, we should be looking to try to do to make the most of those areas that we are establishing our seed mixes in is to try and combine all those benefits and stack um, those benefits for the different types of insects um, on farm. And we also have to be a little bit careful that we don't provide a disservice. So not all biodiversity is good if you are a farmer um, and you certainly don't want to be disproportionately encouraging um, pest insects or disease, as we talked about previously, um, above um, the, the things that might give you a, a level of control of that pest or disease. This is just a quick bit of data um, from a, a four-year DEFRA project that I was involved in one of the last Portlink projects where we looked at the impacts of relatively small, just two metre wide flowering field margins on many things. This is some data um, from brassicas where we have 
uh, in yellow, the mean aphids per plot, and in green, um, the percentage parasitism, um, where we found that certainly next to our flowering field margins, we were able to encourage parasitism and reduce um, aphid numbers as a possible result. It's a, almost another conversation how we actually then look to try and draw those benefits further into the crop. Different insects will move from peripheral habitats, different distances into crops, and actually drawing some of those benefits into the centre of larger fields may require um, a bit of additional thinking. Just to finish off, this is, this is the, the field lab that I wanted to, to mention um, that, that I'll become involved in. Like I said, I'm not leading it. I think it's being coordinated by, by AHDB, but very happy to be here as one of the, one of the research partners um, involved to introduce it. Um, it involves Newcastle University, which is where I work now. It also involves Stockbridge Technology Centre uh, and ADAS as well, providing some of the, the research input into the project. And we're working across five farms in what you might broadly call the north of England, so sort of York um, up, to, up to Newcastle. And we'll be looking at flower power for pest control, as we've called it. And we'll be looking to assess the, the impact of establishment technique and plant species mixtures on the distribution, diversity and abundance of pest natural enemies that are supported um, by these flowering habitats. And as part of that project, we're also very, um, very pleased to be working on some of the, the tools that are being developed um, by other um, other, other, other researchers, so at, at CH, for example, we're looking at the, the CIST project that's been running now for a few years on this topic. It's started to develop some neat tools like eSurveyor um, that we're hoping to use, a sort of mobile phone app so that we can um, use that to, to classify our, our flowering field margins and identify the flowering species that are growing there. And I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. A really good. Um, and I think what also that does highlight is that the project we've just been talking about, this most recent one, this has been brought to us by a group of farmers from that particular region saying, you guys do so much research in the south of England and in the Midlands where it's nice and warm. We're in the north. It's a little bit different up here. The research doesn't work for us. Mm. And we said, yeah, fine, we'll put it in your place then. We'll do it with you. A absolutely. It's something we're something with sort of that, that regional difference between a lot of the things that can um, certainly cover croppings, one that we're looking at on our own. We have a sort of Newcastle University farms covering about 800 hectares, mixed livestock and arable, and really want to do more with cover cropping. But of course, it's a bit more challenging the further north you go, the season's a bit shorter. Um, so how can we're looking at ways that we can make that work and, and, and really looking at machinery solutions to help overcome some of that using things like Avidex spreaders, for example, to enable us to put um, place cover crops into, into standing crops before harvest to give us that bias, almost that bit of extra time to get the cover crop established. But yeah, it's, it, it's certainly an important point that when you look at any particularly biologically based solutions they they will be dependent on things like weather on things like soil type um so it's it is important to look at or to, to sort of validate that things that might work well in one situation could also work well in another or to try and find out if not why not um, and to look at ways to overcome those challenges that might be specific to certain regions or even farms or even fields within a farm where some things may work better in one field than they might do in another yeah, because we know that's the problem in reality, isn't it? That we're not, it's not, we talk about a field lab. A, a field itself is a lab on its own, but the field next door is a totally different one. Yes. Yeah. One of the things that we do with innovative farmers' trials is we try to have more than one farmer involved. Often it's not practical to have the trials actually on anything other than just the one farm, but the living mulches trial is one that we're running. There's one of the very, one farm is in, in Shropshire. There's another one in Oxford, and there's other researchers in um, Lingfield area. I can't remember what county that one's in, and in Cambridge. And so we've got the replication sometimes is between different parts of the country, not just within the field. And we yes. try to have replicates, and we try to. And particularly behind this trial in Yorkshire is a group of farmers who have a no-till farming system, um, and they are looking to weigh how can they get the beneficial plants to actually physically grow in the field. Because mm. as farmers, the it makes sense. It makes absolute sense to let's make sure we have food for the beneficial insects. But yeah. How do we make it happen? That's the point behind this one. So, um, um, I can see what questions we've got. Um, yeah, one of the questions is 
I think perhaps we haven't got a specific question, particularly to you, David, but actually to the group, of, to, if all the, if all the panellists wish to pop up, as one of the things that's been raised is about cost benefit analysis and the, and the effects that this has on the farming profitability because research. So comments from any of you as to, as the, as to how you justify it from a farming point of view, not just from a theoretical point of view. Ali. Um. It's a hard one, actually, especially when you're faced with a business partner who's saying, nobody's paying me to do this. You know, what, are we, what benefit are we going to get? And yeah, of course, when you first want to try something, you, you don't know what benefit you're going to get. Um, I think it's really, really important. I think the point's very well made that we've got to be able to demonstrate cost benefit analysis. But I think Anne also raised a very important point that we do need the ELMS scheme to fund some of this stuff and actually trying to get the policymakers to engage at the level of detail that's needed on the types of measures. Um, and I think horticultural crops are a great example of where income foregone just doesn't work. What we should be trying to do with ELMS in horticultural crops is to incentivize best practice. Um, and if best practice is introducing predators, introducing wildflowers, introducing cover crops, then give the farmers a leg up with some funding from the ELM scheme to enable it to happen faster. Um, but actually having those conversations when the whole thing is predicated on income foregone, it feels sometimes like it's an impossible battle, but I, I would just like to support what Anne said, but I think it's a really well-made point. If you can't demonstrate the cost benefit, um, it's very difficult then to sell it into the farming community. And I know that as a far from having been a farmer, it's dead easy for, for someone selling you something to prove that it works without really having the science behind it, but you've got to take this on board sometimes. It's... Anne, any further comments? Well, in the saline irrigation trial, we did do costing, and that was part of the report. It was more difficult with the trap crops because, for example, when you're thinking about extending a rotation, because of the level of PCN, the complexity of calculating costs. Um, we decided not to go there with the trap crop. But... Yeah. yeah, a whole farm analysis becomes very complicated, but um, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, George, any comments on that? Um, well, lots of things flip through my mind. Um, Ali's made me think long and hard about uh, how, how, how to get be best practice. The best practice point is a really, really good one and how we spread it uh, to a, a, a great many farmers are quite resistant to change. Um, I think it's fair to say you talk to many people about soil health and all the rest of it. You can get into a conversation about plowing. Well, I've always plowed. I don't want to spend all my, a lot of money on, on new kit. The system works well for me, but those of us who've not plowed for a long time and have convinced ourselves that our soils are healthier because of it, and that we're losing less soil down the river, um, have convinced ourselves. But how you get through to the to the attitude that I've always done it like this and it's, it's done me fine, I don't know. A little aside is that I was paddling on a part of the Thames yesterday, and at one point we were we because the Thames the, the section of the Thames we were in in Oxfordshire was quite full. Um, we went for a little paddle out onto a, an, a maize stubble with no, um, no cover crop or anything in it, just bare stubble with the Thames running all over it and then back into the, into the river again. I was pretty horrified, but I see that sort of thing all too often. And why you would be growing maize by a river, I have no idea anyway. And, and that farmer is seeing their soil. It is bad on so many, so many levels. And, you know, just not plowing is only the start of it. It's, it's the whole farm structure. And to go back to the point of the question, the cost benefit analysis, in our case, we're looking for ways to make our whole farm more profitable. And if we can work the sheep in with the rate and grow the rate, maybe it's, it's got to be a lost leader, but it's still, you can cash in some value with your following week crop, um, then it works. But I'm not trying to cost it on a, on a very small basis, a micro basis while we're doing the trial. That's just too complicated and too much work. To dispute slightly the um, questioner, a cost benefit analysis is not the whole story because when introducing cover crops or biofumigants or trap crops, 
many growers are worried that this is going to bring other problems. For example, increase the uh, parasitic nematodes, free living nematodes, or wireworm. And no amount of cost benefit is going to overcome those fears that we are naturally risk averse. And so just the potential for there being other problems by the new techniques discourages people. And so some research is needed to find out whether those fears are well-founded or not. Yeah, um, I think that's actually a really important point. Um, one of the issues we have with, the farm, with farmers is, is they're willing to change if they know how to change. Um, they understand that there's a need to make changes. So um, we need to make sure it's economically viable to do these things. All these trials are worked on the basis that the farmers are looking in that direction anyway. Um, mm -hmm. Particular question again, standing this one, convince farmers in Scotland, convinces farmers in the north of England that these changes that are all being supported because they work in I think the south. Um, and equally, I'm in Devon. You know, persuading the, the mixed farmers in Devon that these strategies are necessary um, is something that, that we have to do, not just target it on the London-centric way of thinking. And I think we all understand that one. Um, so I lost myself on the questions on this. Um, there was a big, a broader question. Um, what advice would we all give to any farmer thinking about doing research on their own farm? Or would you recommend farmers do research on their own farm? George, David first and then Ali. Yeah, I absolutely would. I think it's a fantastic way to, to have a go at something, if it's something that you're interested in and do it on a you know a small area of field so that you, you almost minimise risk. We, we see it quite a lot, or I see it from the perspective of a lot of our agriculture students because they come from farming backgrounds. A lot of them will do their final year big experimental project back on their, their home farms. The biggest challenge that they face is that it, it, we've already mentioned the importance of having a, a control where you don't do anything where you keep everything the same so that you can compare whatever change whatever new method you're you're testing to what what what, what it would be if you hadn't made that change or method so that you can actually look to see um, if what you've you've um, you've done has had an impact so I think that would probably be the most important thing that I would suggest is that you think about from the point of view when you're setting the trial up, whether you can have a control that goes alongside whichever treatment or method you're looking to um, to explore, because that gives you that, that extra confidence that what you've done has actually um, had some kind of impact. Ali. Um, I would employ the KISS strategy, keep it simple, stupid, um, which actually, Dave's absolutely right, you need a control, but don't try to test too much um, because <laughs> we've got the biggest variable, um, uh, which is of course the weather and, and what each season does to us is so different. Um, you know, I mean, I can go, I can tell you, you know, 2012, we had all that rain all summer, you know, it was horrendous. 2019, flooding, 2017, all that heat. You remember, um, according to what happened to your crop, what the weather has done and, and that variability uh, means that actually the other thing is as well as keep it simple stupid you also need it's, it's a long game so you don't just do it for a year think about it as a three or five year project even if the funding isn't there because oh god everybody wants you to deliver results within two or three years which is often in farming nigh on impossible um so think long term and keep it simple just try and test one or two things. Don't try and test too many because with all your other variables, you won't know what's worked and what hasn't. And I completely agree with Dave. You need to look at um, what happens if I haven't done anything, which is the control. But keep it simple, stupid. Great. Um, to agree with David first, that so many people say they've done a trial, but without having had a control. So that that's number one. But then secondly, it's to involve somebody else, because I'm aware of many trials that have been set up, but yet when it came to harvest or time to take measurements, the farm was very busy and it was the trial that got abandoned. So if 
others are involved, then you feel a responsibility for them to go through with it and complete it. Yeah. Apart from the fact that somebody else's ideas are always worth hearing. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase something from one of the Innovative Farmers videos from a dairy farmer that um, has done quite a few trials and very involved. And he says the one thing about the Innovative Farmers and having the group is that you know there's another idiot doing the same thing as well. <laughs> and and <laughs> just trying something and not feeling as though you're just being, oh my, you know, I'm going to give this a go, but I'm not going to tell anybody in case it goes wrong. It doesn't matter if it goes wrong. You learn from something going wrong as well. And that's the thing we need to learn. George, do you want to just add to anything else? Um, well, I just want to agree with everybody. Yeah, Anne was, is a very wise, uh, uh, especially not being a farmer herself, that you can put all the work in as a farmer, but things do get lost in the heat of harvest. We did a we, we we took part in a small nitrogen trial with Niab Tag last summer, and um, I set my brother to cutting the different plots in the in the two fields we were doing it in, uh, without giving him the plastic bags that we were supposed to be getting a grain sample from every plot, and so we missed two plots out of six, which was a bit embarrassing, um, but um, we we, re <laughs> we recovered to a degree. But it's very important to, yes, farmers, if you've got the opportunity, we've got these huge, great laboratories outside with sunshine, water and variable weather, as Ali pointed out. Um, and yeah, we've, we, we could have done a lot more over the years and I wish we had. And we, we're now involved with the potential one or two things for this coming season, which I'm excited about. And I just haven't got back to the Innovative Farmers website to see what's going on. And I've got so many questions myself, I need to actually sit down and think about what's realistic to, to try out and, and get involved again, because it's a, it's a brilliant idea and works really, really well. Right, thank you. We've only got a minute left, and I know that you, we're going to be cut off if we carry on, so I'm not going to um, ask any more questions. Um, what I'm going to do is take the opportunity of thanking, first of all, the panellists for their time present, producing their presentations in the first place, being involved in the project all the way through, and thank you for the, the words of support for what we're doing and we've been doing for the past 10 years. Um, and thank you for your time and, and your insights into and helping us get across the impression of what we want everybody outside to understand about um, innovative farmers and the way that farmers can, can learn from each other. And also thank ORFC for allowing us the opportunity to do this. And um, just thank you all for attending because without you guys attending and listening and learning and coming back to us with more questions, there is no point to us being here. So absolutely thank you very much for your time. Have a good rest of the day. And I hope if you can avoid the big C, I fortunately haven't had any symptoms, so it's very irritating, but I just hope that we can keep clean and safe and have a really good year and all this political rubbish that's going on doesn't end up mucking everything up. Thank you very much. <laughs>